This will be a bit of a continuation, I think, of some of the themes we've been hearing about over the uh, last couple of days. So, first of all, in the pre-diagnostic space, um, I think we've already actually seen a different figure from this same paper. You know, this concept of how we are thinking about uh, men in terms of their germline genetics is really heating up pretty quickly. I will be honest, I have been skeptical as to what the clinical role of the polygenic scores is going to be. I'm definitely been coming around partly at this meeting. Um, you know, and I, I think the notion of interpreting the single gene mutations differently in the setting of one of these polygenic scores uh, really will have, I think, some implications for practice. Now, I would emphasize, though, what I said before, that I don't think PSA is going anywhere anytime remotely soon, especially at the primary care level. Uh, PSA is still going to be extremely hard to beat. It's a $20 test. You can order it as part of a regular chemistry panel. And a negative, a negative PSA, meaning below median, is extremely, extremely protective in terms of having a very strong negative predictive value for a meaningful cancer. And one of the nice things that's evolved over the years is that while PSA varies with age, it really does not vary with race or other factors. This is a summary of several really well done prospective cohort studies um, from Mark Preston. And the, the median PSA at age uh, in your 40s is around 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 by the time you get to your early 50s. Uh, pushing one by the time you get to 60. And this is extremely consistent across different cohorts, different time periods. There's even a giant one, quarter million people out of Japan, showing exactly the same numbers. 75th percentile is hovering around one, uh, 1 1.5 by the time you get to 60. And this is partly where the 1.5 threshold comes from. Now, it's important to note, out, note here the 90th is 1 1.7, 1.9. So you know, if we're screening with the idea of finding uh, finding cancers early with, a, with heavy secondary screening before biopsy, um, then you know, this early baseline PSA is not going anywhere. We can wipe out 75% of the population's risk with a single cheap test that primary care already knows about. They just need to learn better how to interpret it. And this is breaking news and something that I'm really excited about. Um, after a two-year conversation with the primary care leadership at UCSF, which have always been very much in line with the US task force, and task force said, don't screen, we don't screen. Uh, we now have a protocol baked into our EMR system um, at UCSF across the whole primary care network uh, such that the primary docs are prompted to at least have a shared decision-making conversation with men. They don't have to get the PSA, but they have to either mark that they ordered the PSA or the man didn't want it. Um, and you can see what thresholds we're using here. For men 45 to 60, um, less than one, you're done. The data would say you're done for 25 years. You know, we're saying at least five uh, just for clinical comfort for the time being. Um, if it's intermediate, which we're defining as up to two for men younger, up to three for men over 60, uh, then either recheck pretty soon or consider early referral. And referral does not mean biopsy. It means using all the markers we've been talking about at this meeting. Um, definitely refer over two or over three. Uh, all right, moving on to post-diagnosis. Uh, so we all, we referenced this already, this whole issue with, you know, the NCCN dropping preferred. It is, you know, it's a nice piece of news that the low-risk group um, is once again marked as preferred, although there's still this, you know, kind of caveat language here that was not there in the previous NCN, NCCN uh, guideline. So active surveillance preferred for most patients. What is new here is a bit of a stronger endorsement of additional workup. Uh, consider confirmatory uh, multiparametric MR and prostate biopsy um, and or molecular analysis uh, if the MRI was not performed initially. Um, this is Again, consider this by no means says it has to be done, and I don't think any of us that work in this field would really encourage routine, pervasive use of markers for all men. Um, the and and to stress the point again, you know, this whole debacle about the very low versus low patients and what's preferred really just highlights the fact that we're dealing with a literally 20th century risk stratification system uh, that has become increasingly cumbersome to use. The NCCN and the AUA risk groups do not even align anymore, and we really need to move past this as a specialty. Um, this was alluded to, um, I think maybe Brian was going to get to this in one of the cases if we had a little more time, uh, this question of whether men on active surveillance, uh, whether men with BRCA mutations can safely go on active surveillance. And I've had some nice offline conversations at this meeting as well about this. The only good data so far is this paper from Hopkins, uh, which looked at their cohort, looking at men with BRCA1 and 2 or ATM mutations or BRCA2 alone. And lo and behold, they do have a higher likelihood of upgrading. This is not a surprise. Um, the uh, relative risk in a multivariable analysis was twofold for any of these mutations, uh, nearly threefold for those with a bracket two. 
So does this mean that men with, you know, 43-year-old, 48-year-old man with one core of 3 plus 3 cannot go on active surveillance? I would argue absolutely not. Um, in other words, he absolutely can go on surveillance, you know, because the question is, so where do these curves top out here? Well, this is the 50% line here. So 50% of men are going to upgrade by six years. Does that mean that nobody can go on active surveillance at baseline? First of all, of course, 50% of the men did not upgrade by six years, and six years is not nothing in terms of surveillance. I would much rather have my prostate out at 60 than 55. I'd rather have it out in 2027 than in 2022, um, or radiated or whatever. Um, so it's really important to remember that active surveillance does not imply go home, you never need to be treated. This means it does not need to be treated now. And even for men with these mutations, the window of opportunity for cure is likely measurable still in many years. Great study from Mike Liebman uh, late last year, looking at how these markers are actually getting used around the country. Uh, not surprisingly, I showed the slide earlier about variation in use of active surveillance. There is similar major variation in use of molecular markers. These are the post-diagnostic markers, uh, Oncotype, Decipher, and Prolaris. And depending on which hospital region you are in, the use of markers ranges from 0% to nearly 50% of all newly diagnosed men. Lots of variation around the country and trends toward increase, but there's clearly some regions where the increase is much faster than in others for a variety of reasons. And a lot of this, of course, comes down to uh, random variation. We've also been able to take a deeper dive into the what low-risk cancer actually means genomically, beyond just looking at a summary score like the archetype or the decipher. Uh, Laurie showed a, a piece of uh, showed the, the broader version of this figure yesterday. Um, this is 20 different risk signatures which have been published over the years. And if you actually look using the, the decipher data, the transcription data, uh, these tend to line up with each other. So, and this is reassuring, um, you can be high on if you're high on Decipher, for example, you tend to be high on most of the other risk scores. Same goes for, for Oncotype, et cetera, as well as a lot of academic signatures that have been published and never really commercialized here. Um, and 2% you know, of the patients in the, 2 of the patients who have Gleason 3-3 tumors wind up in the top quartile of risk across the whole uh, Decipher grid population. Um, and this, again, means that we need to be looking at them, and we need to be thinking a little bit more about variations in the genomic, uh, genomic nature of these tumors. We're also getting, with <clears throat> use of the grid data, we're getting closer to, prediction, uh, to predictive markers. There's a lot of discussion in this field that all of our markers are prognostic. They tell us who's going to do well, who's not going to do well, but they don't tell us what to do. A predictive marker can actually tell you if you do radiation, such and such will happen. If you do not do radiation, uh, something else will happen. And we're getting closer to that. Um, on the Decipher grid data, uh, Felix Feng and his colleagues at ECSF uh, published the Porto score. This is a couple years old now, but there's a big prospective trial um, that should hopefully be coming out this year on this. Um, and this is, so these are retrospective data, so you always have to take it with a bit of a grain of salt because there are some selection biases here. But if you have a high Porto score, the delta in terms of early metastases between men who did not get post-operative radiation therapy and did get post-operative radiation therapy is massive. But conversely, if you've got a low Porto score, the curve's actually flipped. You do better if you do not get radiation therapy than if you do get radiation therapy. Now, again, these are retrospective data. I've not met a single radiation oncologist, including Felix, who is withholding radiation to post-op men who otherwise uh, qualify for it based on a low portal score. Uh, but as the prospective studies come out, this will be a very interesting space to follow. Uh, very similar uh, signature uh, published from Jeff Carnes looking at post-operative ADT response and very similar. High ADT response signature big difference between getting post-op ADT and not getting post-op ADT, whereas if your signature is low, there's really no difference. Now again, retrospective data, nobody's really acting on these yet, but we're getting closer. And if anybody orders the, the Decipher grid as part of practice, we get these reports on every patient. Um, now, I've, we've had a lot of conversations with uh, our medical oncologists, and I've not convinced anybody that when we see a uh, grid signature like this, 6th percentile for ADT response, 93rd for docetaxel, that maybe we should be intensifying ADT with ADT plus dosi rather than ADT plus uh, abiraterone, because these are all still based on retrospective data and some of them are purely in silico. But as markers like this evolve, I think we're really going to get closer to, uh, to be, being able to use uh, genomic information derived from the primary tumor to make initial and follow-on treatment decisions. Um, final point on, on markers, and this I think alluded to yesterday in terms of the quality of the reports. It's a great study from Adam Murphy, um, again late last year, looking at a population in Chicago with very variable health literacy. 
And they looked to see, does getting an archetype score increase the likelihood that you will go on active surveillance? There was no statistically significant difference here, but in fact, those with low literacy, if anything, had a trend toward lower use of active surveillance after getting the marker. And I, I promise this is because of the way the, for, the test is formatted and the way these you know, intermediate risk boxes come out at the top. Uh, and finally, we are getting richer in terms of how we can actually customize active surveillance. Lori alluded to this yesterday in the earlier version of the canary model, which is now on the web. Uh, by looking at things like whether you've had a negative biopsy after diagnosis, time since diagnosis, BMI, uh, PSA kinetics actually do matter, uh, number of cores involved. We have a multivariable model based on clinical information alone that can really stratify men quite accurately in terms of how they're going to do over at least the next five years. Um, and we can basically take 10 to 20 percent of the whole surveillance population and put them on much more of a watchful waiting paradigm or at least a less active surveillance paradigm and tell these men with great confidence you do not need anything done for five years. And you barely need a PSA check, let alone MRIs and biopsies. Uh, now where the markers are going to fit in, this is still breaking, you know, evolving news. Uh, GPS did not pan out in the Canary study. There's a lot of other marker studies ongoing. And final comment, an actual honest-to-God RCT has been completed by Todd Morgan in Michigan. This is a cluster randomized trial where they've randomized practices in Michigan to do decipher testing or not. So far, all they have is decision-making uh, data, but those in the GC arm who had high-risk uh, scores were much more likely to get post-operative radiation therapy, which is entirely appropriate, um, which we do not, of course, see in the, in the control arm. Now, it'll take a longer, longer time to, um, to actually get the, uh, whether this is actually changing clinical outcomes, but uh, that is some breaking news.